Okay. Good morning. Hello. Um, my name is Carl Blythe, and I'm the director of CORAL. And CORAL stands for the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. And we're really happy today to be sponsoring a workshop on what we're calling BOLD, following an acronym that was created, I guess, by Catherine. Did you? No, no. no? It was the group. Oh. We had a meeting like this online, and we went through all of the possibilities. There were OLDs and OLDs, and we came up with BOLD. So <laughs> just to make sure you know all what the acronyms stand for, BOLD means basic online language learning, which is really important, the two L's, language learning, it's the two L's that we have in CORAL, uh, and design and delivery. So that covers a lot of things. We're talking about designing materials, designing curricula for language learning, and then once you design it, you have to deliver it. So, and we're not talking about upper levels, we're talking about the basic intro levels. So that's really our focus today. Um, before I introduce our speakers, and kick this off, let me say just a couple of words about why we wanted, why we're doing this. Um, during the past year, I would say, we have had lots of interactions with faculty here at the University of Texas at Austin about this very notion, this very topic, basic online language learning design and delivery, although we weren't using that acronym BOLD, but that's really what it was all about. And uh, UT Austin is not particularly different because this idea, this topic is being discussed all over the country. We go to conferences and people have very similar stories. We're sharing our stories with each other. Um, for all kinds of reasons, people are trying to migrate their uh, courses online. And people then are beginning to share their stories about how difficult it is, that migration. Um, that they hadn't really thought about these technological problems that they were encountering, or that the idea of social presence is quite different in an online setting than it is in face-to-face. -face. I mean, people have this notion, but then when the reality hits them, it's um, more sometimes than they, they know what they, that, that they can deal with. So we were also um, at Coral noticed that we, we were talking to a lot of faculty here at UT who were, um, well, quite frankly, being pushed to develop materials and courses. And um, they were doing it quickly. And we wanted just to kind of slow it down a little bit and have some kind of discussion among ourselves. So we did have, we do have a selfish reason for having this, this gathering, and that is to create some kind of ongoing discussion uh, here at UT with people who were involved with online language learning and design and delivery. So we hope that this will just be the beginning, not the end, but the beginning of a discussion and we'll be able to form some kind of working groups around uh, these topics. Okay, so that's the background. Uh, I'm really happy today to have two people here who know a lot, a lot about BOLD. And I don't know if you can want to come over here. I, we do. We have a camera here, Marlene. so yeah. So this is Marlene John Shoy, and Marlene is from Carla at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Carla stands for the Center for Advanced Research on Language Acquisition. Okay, lots of acronyms here this morning. So we, we never say that. All we say is Carla. It's all a Carla, right? So Carla is one of our sister LRCs. There are 15 national foreign language resource centers all over the the United States. And Carla uh, uh, has been around for 20 years. It's one of the, the, the old guard. Coral is brand new compared to, to Car Carla. And we're not competitive at, that, at, at all. Um, they're, they're, I, we were just talking this morning about all of their summer institutes. Carla has done an incredible job in their teacher training. I think that's one of the things that they're, they're known for. And in training for technology, teacher training for technology. And that's, of course, part of, of what Marla does. She is their technological coordinator at CAR. Is that your title exactly? What is your title? I have a new title. Now I'm the um, Online Education Program Director. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> so her background, of course, is in technology and teacher training. And that's what we're and talking Spanish. about. And Spanish. And Spanish. And before that, music. Great. Okay. <laughs> so that's Marlene. We have name tags. And so if you want to 
talk to us. Uh, we have the chat room going in just a minute. You'll be able to see how the Adobe Connect. We're also doing this as a webinar, so there are many people joining us from all over the world. So we'll be making sure that we're talking to the people in the room as well as the people who are joining us online. So that's Marlene. So Catherine, our other speaker, is a French professor from Virginia Commonwealth University and one of the co-founders, or founders, uh, co-founder of BOLD, and remember that stands for Basic Online Language Learning Design and Delivery. And um, what can I say about Catherine? I've seen Catherine at many different conferences talking about her experiences as a French professor, again, migrating from the on face-to-face -face uh, experience to, to the online experience. And she has a wealth of, uh, of experience in this area and talking a lot about what works and what hasn't worked right, from, from her own experiences. So um, that's the basic introduction. We have a couple of technicians, people who are helping us with the technology, but I want to say right up front that Adobe Connect is not perfect and sometimes there are problems. Uh, if you have a problem um, with Adobe Connect, you can uh, ask uh, Natalie. She's going to be checking in the chat room. She'll be responding to any uh, issues that you may be having. Uh, let's say the volume is not working or whatever reason, whatever problem it may be. Uh, and we'll try to troubleshoot as we go along. And that, of course, is one of the reasons we wanted to do this, because we wanted to give people the sense of this online experience. Even though sitting in the room, we're talking about online issues. And one of those issues is, gee, the technology is not working. How do I troubleshoot it? OK, so let me turn it over to our uh, presenters. And again, thank you all for joining us today. We're going to be here from 9 today all the way to 4 this afternoon. We're taking a break for lunch. At, at the, the webinar will end at 12 o'clock, and the rest of you will be staying here. Okay? Thank you. Thanks so much, Carl and, and Natalie and Rachel. And welcome. We're so happy to, to see you here. Um, I think we maybe need to just quickly go through the webinar check um, because when it comes to the time for the breakout room, and we're only going to do one, but we want you to see how a breakout room works, please don't use the video. We tried this ourselves, and it's been my experience. I use Blackboard Collaborate. Um, that It just takes way too much bandwidth, and then everything falls apart. So please don't use the video. Use the audio, but don't use the video. Did we need to say anything else about what they're going to be doing in the breakout room technically? We'll do that when we get there. And when we get there. All right. So stay tuned for that. Um, you'll see down in the bottom that there is a PowerPoint. You have access to the online PowerPoint, which is at Google Flex Blicka. And um, the handouts are also on a, a bit.ly, a Google, whatever. Um, so you, can, you will need the handouts. Uh, the PowerPoint is something you might want to look at later, because some of the slides, we have a lot of slides. We're going to be going through a bunch of them really quickly, because they're just there as background for you to look at, um, but we're not reading through them. OK. Did we have printouts for anybody here in the room? We didn't, we didn't print. No. OK. So right. we're not killing trees today, whether you're yeah. online or in yeah. the room. No trees have been killed for this. Looks like most everybody has. The laptop. So, yeah. So our workshop goals today. Um, we want to help you begin uh, your strategies uh, by using what's called ADDIE, which stands for A, analyze, D, design, D, develop, I, implement, and E, evaluate. And we'll more or less be working through this uh, in, in that order. What we want you to go away with today, um, having looked at some basic online language courses in action uh, from a wide variety, so you, you can look at quite different ways that different places are doing online language teaching and learning. Uh, we've got the worksheets that I just referred to that are 
a lot of times sets of questions, things for you to go back and ponder. Um, we also have a really long list of additional resources and a bibliography. Uh, again, really good places to start, and I'm sure you'll have some of your own. And then also, BOLD is a collaboratory. It is open to anyone and everyone. All you have to do is go to the BOLD site and ask to be put in, and then you become one of the members of the collaboratory. I'll show you in a minute where to find that. And then, of course, we also have the wonderful CORAL um, people and with all of their resources and Paula. So that's what we're doing today. Before, and you, before you go on, did everyone get a chance to get the URL for the handouts? No. Nope. Do you want to flip back, back there for just a second? Yeah, I'm going to go back to that. Window as well if you're on an online meeting. Oh, okay. The PowerPoint isn't working. It is. But try the link in the chat window that I just posted. <coughs> try the one in the chat window to figure out why this one oh, isn't. Oh, yeah. It looks, it looks like it is a different URL. OK. I okay. can adjust and fix it. I'll fix it in the PowerPoint. And it worked then? Okay, and it worked. Good. OK. Great. Great. Yeah. The link in the slides is wrong, but the one I'm gonna I'm gonna fix the link in the slides right now. So. Right. So if you copy and paste it from the slide, it works. But if you click it, it does not. So okay. Let's see anchor and product. let's use this as a learning thing. Uh, I very frequently uh, use all of the Google tools because my students and I can be on our Google PowerPoints and slides and documents and spreadsheets and making these changes on the fly as it's porting into a synchronous class. Really powerful to be able to do something like what uh, Natalie is doing right now and flip it on the fly because you're going to need to make changes sometimes on the fly. So are we good there? All right. Um, introductions. We've done introductions. Uh, the Addy model is what we'll do from 9.30 or 9.20 or 920 or so <laughs> until 945. Um, we're going to go through analyzing. Then you get a break. Uh, and that goes for you people who are there online with us, too. You're going to get your break. Uh, demonstrations, we're going to show you these number of different online courses, a wide range of them. Then we're going to look at a bunch of tools that are appropriate. There's no way to go through all the tools. We're just going to give you smatterings. We're going to give you ideas of where you can start to be looking for some and maybe give you uh, an, uh, an opportunity to actually look at some of them. And then we're going to talk about best practices and social presence, which is really important. And that ends our morning. The afternoon schedule will be different. All right. So we've already introduced Coral. And uh, I guess we didn't get a chance to see Rachel and Natalie. but. They're here. They're here. <laughs> um, you want to say some more about Carl? All right. Um, Carl mentioned that we're a sister LRC up in Minnesota, at the University of Minnesota, um, and that we do a lot of teacher ed programs. So our busy time is in the summer when most teachers are, I won't say off. Teachers are never off. But when they have a little more time, we'll say that. Um, and we do everything from. Um, strategies for language learning to immersion programs to the technology that I work with to pragmatics, all sorts of different things, second language acquisition. So a lot of different programs um, for teachers specifically at CARLA. And we have a huge website, um, www.carla.umn.edu, which we should is probably in your list of resources. If it's not, it will be. <laughs> so that's CARLA. And again, the Bold Collaboratory, I'm going to take you to our wiki. And this is our wiki. Um, and all you would have to do is, when you go onto it, it might ask you if you want to sign up for it, in which case it uh, lets me put you in and put your name in. Uh, this explains who we are, what we are, uh, when we do, where we do what we do for whom it is, how we do it, and why we do it. Um, we've been giving presentations at ACTFL, NECTFL, SCOLT, um, just all over the place. 
<laughs> Thanks. We had a little bit of feedback here. Um, so you can, you can take a look at the PowerPoints that have been given at all these other um, presentations. And we are starting to work on a bold guide to pull all of this together to have it. Uh, most likely we're going to have a paper copy, but it, this stuff needs to be online because it's rapidly changing. So it will be in a wiki sort of format, most likely, like this. And it will be online. It will be open because we believe with Coral that uh, learning should be open. And um, we build it. So when I say bold, it's not me. It's us. And anyone, everyone who wants to be a part of this certainly can. You do as much as you can, when you can. And it works pretty well, pretty well so far. Uh, so at any rate, that's the bold collaboratory. Any questions so far? Then let me get out of this and go back to a full screen on this. Um, can we kind of get an idea from you who's here? Can you look at the, um, we could turn, can we turn the, the camera around? We were talking yeah. about doing that. So we're going to get a shot of you guys so that everybody who's out there in virtual land can take a look at you and say hi. So those of you who are online, we're moving the camera around. And these are the folks who are here at UT with us today in the beautiful Glickman Center. How many people are joining us online? 28. 28? Okay. And we have 28 people online. And how many of you out here are online? <laughs> Two, four, six. So we probably have about 22 people who are truly online, but we have some online and face-to-face -face people as well. There's so people we have folks from Lebanon, Guatemala, Montreal. Okay. Is anyone else in the room experiencing that? It might just be the wireless right here that maybe we're overloading it a bit. Yeah. Okay, so there, there was a question about uh, the connectivity going in and out, and we decided that it might be uh, that there's just too heavy traffic on the Wi-Fi in this room, and this probably is taking a great deal of bandwidth. Video. Video. So, you know, just be patient. And, but it's good that you're having this. Because you need to think this through. This is a part of where the rubber meets the road. All righty. Um, so we've. Who else do we have? Who's joining us? We have people from Dallas. Dallas. Abilene. Abilene. Um, St. Louis. St. Louis. South Carolina. South Carolina. New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah, that's, that's what they wrote on. Okay. So hi everyone. All righty. Um, we did a participant survey, and we'll just take a quick look at what you have already let us know. Um, the primary reasons for taking this workshop are people are seeking skills for teaching online. They're interested in the technologies and the media and in assessment strategies. Um, we're not going to be doing that much on the assessment strategies because assessment is huge, but we will address it in the afternoon. Um, grade level, the majority of people are post-secondary. We do have uh, a person in elementary. We've got some middle school, high school, non-specific, and other folks. Uh, I think one of the other folks said she's actually in one grade level, but she'll be designing for another. Um, and the levels of your students. This is bold. This is the novice and intermediate level. That's what we do. That's the basic online language learning design and delivery. And uh, so we'll take a look at some more of these later. But already, one of the reasons that I like to use the, the surveys is so that students can have voice before we even get into a class. And so you as participants have had a, 
an opportunity to actually say something and participate before you even showed up. And then I can tailor, and we can tailor more specifically what we're doing, and real good reason to use participant surveys. So we're going to go into the ADDIE model. Okay, the ADDIE model is used by instructional, yes, question. I'm sorry, this no. is no longer showing what you're showing. Like mine has me in, looks like a chat room meeting already. Mm -hmm. So did we lose our... Uh, Okay, for those of you online, we're talking about the fact that sometimes you can't see our slides, but you're just seeing the Adobe Connect room. Um, refresh, I think it's just a connection problem. Okay, so our tech people are saying it's maybe just a connection problem and that if you refresh, it should go. But you need to let your students know when you're teaching fully online, this happens. It's a part of your orientation with them so that they don't freak out because in this environment, they're already feeling quite lost. So, you know, we're here face to face and this is happening. Imagine <laughs> you're in a foreign language, um, it's just beginning and, and you're not seeing whatever they're talking about. And let them know ahead of time. Sorry, Addy model. Well, I was gonna say, that's a, a good practice is to do tech practices before your class starts. <laughs> we always do a pre-week just for that specifically. Okay, so this is something that instructional designers use, and you'll notice there's kind of a circle going on here. Um, even though you probably want to start with the analyze, and that is finding out who your audience is and what they know and what their needs are, going into some of the design and development, and then into the implementation, it kind of keeps going around in a circle. These are things you're going to have to come back and revisit and look at again. And that evaluation in the center evaluating how the design's going, how the development's going, how the implement implementation is going. All of that keeps circling around and around as you're developing. And I'm sure those of you who are working on some of this already are aware of that. <clears throat> um, in our particular ADDI model, we put this extra circle in that I borrowed from Shambo, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, I'm say Shambo and Magliaro, um, that has specific things to do <coughs> with education. Most of the ID models come from the commercial world or, yeah, from the training commercial world. And so in, techno in education, we're adding some things in here that I think they're borrowing back from us. And that's looking at backwards design. How many of you are familiar with backwards design? All right, maybe about half those of you in the room or two-thirds. Um, are, are, are our online people aware of the green check kind of an idea? If, if we say raise your hand or yes or no, they can do the green check. So those of you online, can you find the green check? Put it on right now. <laughs> and then you'll have to clear it, Natalie. Getting green checks? All right. Excellent. Okay. So with that backwards design idea, we're starting with I think I have another one, another slide here that shows that up a little closer. Here we go. So we're starting with what will the students learn? What are your goals? And what is the learning outcomes for what you're going to do? And then you need to look at how will you know if the students have learned what it is that your goals are. That's the assessment part. Look at the assessment first. Then back up and say, okay, if this is my assessment, what are the steps I need to take? What are the activities that the students will go through so that they can actually perform that assessment successfully? <laughs> and then go back before that and say, all right, since we're talking about online learning here, what kinds of technology will help my students to do those activities? What kinds of applications and software do I need to use in the activities that the students are doing their learning with? <clears throat> so we want to take, care, take advantage of what technology can give us. And this doesn't necessarily have to be strictly online, hybrid classes, or they're doing homework outside of class on technology and doing that sort of thing. 
So again, another circle. You're starting with the learning outcomes, looking at the assessment, looking how you're going to get there, looking how the technology can help. But again, keep going around and around, reiterating, going through and looking at things again. And I think that's about all we had to say about that, unless you had anything more you wanted to say? No. <laughs> all right. But now we have a quiz that we're going to do in Adobe Connect. Um, those of you who are here, we're going to, if you're not connected with the Adobe Connect, we're just going to have you do it by raising your hand. A um, <laughs> little formative quiz. What does the A in Addy stand for? Of access, accumulate, assess, analyze. No, don't don't give the answer. And is there a way for us to get and see this? If you exit out of that, you can pull up here. So we have to go up and then go into the room. There we go. Oh, that was pretty easy. Alrighty. So. There we go. And we can see that most of you got analyzed correctly because that's what the A of Addy stands for. That's where you start. You have to analyze your context and situation. We're going to go and do some analysis in just a minute. But that was just, were you listening? <laughs> and if it helps, if, if, if we have a lot of people you know, doing something else, that meant that maybe we need to do something first before we actually get into the next part of the lesson great way as an instructor to see in the formative part of the work that you're doing, are they with us? Okay. Let's do the next question then. Yep. And the next question is? They're already voting on it. <laughs> Go ahead and read it out loud. Okay. Does evaluate only happen at the end of the Addy sequence? In the room, how many of you would say yes? How many of you would say no? <laughs> you're, you're watching the online results, aren't you? <laughs> this, is, this is something that I, I just found out about. Uh, I, was, I was reading in, in social media that when people see this, not this bar, but when pe people see this bar, they will actually, it, it's a part of our mirror neuron. We will change our answer, even though we know the correct answer, we'll change it to mirror the group. And it's one of the phenomena of our human brains that we do this. So a good thing not to show the answers in the bar as it's happening. Mm -hmm. So is it possible to hide the answers? You're the actually way? seeing the teacher mode. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the people online would not have seen the results until um, Rachel clicked that broadcast results button. Yep. So once she clicked that, the online people could see the results. So you actually got them first here because you're watching teacher mode. Right. And I don't know if any of you use clickers in your classroom, but this sort of thing happens. And it's something that you need to think through. All righty. Yeah. Back to slide. So back to the slide. And in this next part, we're going to ask you, if you have any questions, to go ahead and ask them in the text chat part of the Adobe Connect. and. Those of you who are here, just sit and think if you have any questions that you want to ask us, and we'll let the folks out in the uh, webinar world have time to write up. their questions and then we'll get um, Rachel to tell us what the questions are. I did go through that very quickly. I'm sure you could spend a week's seminar on Addy. I have a shelf full of books at home <laughs> on instructional design. So that was a really quick overview. And Addy is not the only model. There are other models of instructional design. But this one is just clean, clear, and, and the minute you get into Addy, you'll find that there are lots of people who divide it up in different ways, and that's fine. Whatever helps you start getting uh, an infrastructural idea of what of you're strategizing how you're going to do this. So we have our first question from the 
Kolesa um, is asking, are the quizzes that you gave us made through Adobe? Nicole asked if the quizzes that we gave you are made through Adobe. Yes, that is a built-in part of the Adobe Connect. Um, any other types of, um, what do we want to call this, software or rooms, elements? Web conferencing. Web conferencing, thank you. We'll probably have similar capabilities. And yes, um, I know, I'm pretty sure that WebEx is, because I've been in a lot of WebExes, but also, I, I do know that Blackboard Collaborate has this facility because I use it all the time when I'm in online mode. Do we have any other questions? Um, is it easier to use the video connection if everybody is um, if everybody is in the same room? Uh, question from Leslie. Um, is not in the same room. Isn't in the same room. If all the participants are not in the same room, is it easier? If all the participants are remote, I would say yes, it's easier. It's, the problem is when you've got some people in front of you and some people remote and you've got laptops in the room physically, that we start getting that feedback loop if the speakers aren't turned off and so participation kind of degenerates down to just the text chat level. You might have to repeat the question. Sure That's what I tried to do, but I didn't say it in exactly yeah. the same way. Uh, then from Devon, um, in the Addy model, uh, who does the evaluation and does this include student assessment or is it only to evaluate the course design? So he's asking, was it Evan? Devon. Devon. Asking about the evaluation and is it who does it and is it um, only, I didn't, only the teacher, do the students do feedback? I would say um, yes, yes, and yes to all of them. Everybody should be doing evaluation and feedback. Um, I'm hearing myself feedback. again. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, somebody in the room has their speakers. We need to turn them off. So yes, I would say everyone should be involved in evaluation. Um, the teachers, obviously. The students should be giving feedback. If you've got other teachers who teach the same course, that would be super for them to come in and do some evaluation. And if you've got somebody external, who doesn't work with the materials but is coming in with new eyes, that would be super to do that as well. And one of the things about evaluating, and evaluating when, when we talk about it, we do the whole kit and caboodle and we're talking about uh, student assessment and we're talking about uh, course evaluation and student evaluations, of course, it's the whole kit and caboodle. Um, Including how the course fits into the program. But one of the beauties when you're using a web conferencing tool like this, this is being archived. When it's all done, it's in an archive. And I don't know about Adobe Connect, but Collaborate, I can send that out as an MP3 or an MP4 and have people look at it. If you were to have a colleague who was peer coaching with you, to be able to share with that colleague, someone you feel safe with, because this is kind of scary. You know, you're building this, you're doing your course, and a lot of times we don't want people in our courses looking at them and, and observing us, right? It, it's stressful. But if you're working with someone who's eye to eye with you, they're, they're not going to be making determinations on your salary, um, but they're someone that you're safe with and comfortable with, you can share your archived course with them and say, talk to me specifically, and, and peer coaching I really love, but you know, I would like you to look in this course that I've been doing, I'd like you to look at these sessions and tell me how I'm doing with this specific, that specific element of it, and then have the person get back to you and say to you, you know, not, oh, you're great, you're wonderful, but you know, very specifically, this is what I saw. You weren't talking to the people who were in New Jersey, you were only talking to the people who were in California, or you know, whatever it is. It, sounds really silly, but that kind of thing is a really great way to do course evaluation that um, you can do something about on the fly. And I just, in addition to that, Catherine's talking about recording live sessions if you're doing synchronous sessions. Mm -hmm. Also, if you've got asynchronous classes, which is mostly what I've worked with, invite them in to your you know, Moodle, your Blackboard, or whatever it is, and have them take a look around again, at the student interactions, the student-student interactions, and have them give you some feedback. It would work the same way. This is a specific question. Um, what's the current status and or what's the prognosis on the intellectual property issues surrounding the recordings of things that you make and archive? To whom do those belong? 
<laughs> Should we repeat the question? Yeah. yeah um, she said it was a UT specific question. It, it really isn't. I think it's. Well, the answer is specific, but the question is. <laughs> yes. And that is when you make archived recordings, even when you create courses, who do the, who, what, the intellectual property, who do those belong to? And that's a good, very good question. Well, and one thing really quickly, we're, we're into HIPAA. You know, did I, did I get the right one? HIPAA, FERPA, which one is it? HIPAA, the health. HIPAA, the health. FERPA yeah. is FERPA. Yeah. FERPA. Yeah. FERPA. Um, but we, we have it. a specialist. Yeah, I and mean, this is something Any course design, anything you create, any of that, even with university money, belongs to faculty. Um, now, that's a change mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it depends. Uh, there's there's caveats here because if you use it, yes, and if you're not here, yeah, no, come on now. yeah, we we need to get people on the mic so that the remote pe audience can hear. Well, maybe we can just talk about it another time. So. <laughs> no, I think these are really important questions, and they're good to hear because this these are things that we're all talking about. So please, come on. A quick, quick re um, review. She was saying that anything that's created, even with university monies, now here at the University of Texas, belongs to the faculty. And can I just jump in? Let me jump in real quickly, because there it used to be that Blackboard, if you produced in Blackboard, they were trying to say they owned it. So be careful as you're reading through whatever media you're using, who owns it. Right now, the, I'll just throw this out there, that there's a chartering process, and in, as part of the charter, there's very specific language about this, and it belongs to the faculty member, but the university, the, the slightly messy language is the university reserves the right to license it from the faculty member. Um, so just to make sure that everybody online can hear what's being talked about, here at UT what they're developing is this notion of a charter so that faculty can develop their materials and own the intellectual property right, but the university can license that, that, that material. Um, so I know from my experience at, at Coral that they've told us in the past that if we develop materials using UT technology, like um, video studios or their audio studios and it heavily involves technicians that then it, it is shared intellectual property with the University of Texas. So this is, it seems to be a moving target. Things are changing right they, now. They, the most recent thing, they've shifted that to, because of the moves and everything, yeah. they've shifted it to be more clear that it belongs to the faculty. And, and, and so again, what's being discussed is that the idea is since UT now is developing MOOCs and we are, we are a member of the edX consortium, that they're trying to clarify uh, this ambiguity. And so we now have clear guidelines, or they're developing clear guidelines to know who owns what. Yeah. I think that would be really sticky if you've got different faculty developing different courses in a series, for example. So if someone did Spanish 101, someone else did Spanish 102, someone else did Spanish 103, the Spanish 102 teacher decides to go and teach in Minnesota and takes their course with them because it's their intellectual property. Mm -hmm. What happens to the department sequence? They have to replace the course. That's how, that's how it is right now. Yeah. Um, the, 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 She's saying that they have to replace the course. Well, and I think another sticking point, or one of one of the big issues, is what is the intellectual property? Because, at an abstract level, if you're talking about content, um, when you're writing a textbook, so the ideas and the text, but a lot of the issue is the development of media, which is technology intensive and requires the infrastructure of a university. So when it gets into that domain, who owns it? Is it simply the intellectual property of the professor? Well, it seems like the professor really requires all of his technical staff to actually implement it and do it and create it. So that's that's where, it, where it's a problem. And I suspect that if, if, if a real life situation happened, that somebody tried to take their course away and refused to license it, that then there would be a lot of trouble. lawsuits and things like that. And somebody right. would get more. Like this is, what they're saying is not necessarily how it would play out. But right now, they're trying to be very clear to encourage faculty content and not worry about not owning it and not controlling the distribution rights, 
they have actually said in these charters pretty clearly that ultimately faculty can decide, even with the news, can decide that I don't want it anymore. You know, I, I want to take it off the market and to not distribute it. And they say they will respect. So just to repeat, she was saying that the university is trying to make it more encouraging to faculty to give them the intellectual rights to encourage them to do these types of things, but if it came to a lawsuit, am I saying this right? If it came to a lawsuit, um, there would probably be a big fight, but to encourage the faculty that if they just didn't want it on the market anymore, they could pull it off. So I want to step in here and, and just say we will have the entire afternoon to talk about UT specific topics and we should do that. That's why we were having this kind of morning, general, afternoon, UT specific. Okay? But anyhow, that was a great question and we can still dig in more because there's a lot more to talk about. Well, uh, we will be because Analyze is looking at some of these issues. But I would also, since uh, you raised the issue of intellectual property rights, and um, I would say that you should probably think about open, opening <laughs> up your materials, since we're the Center for Open Educational Resources, and people want to lock down and, and not share their materials. I realize that um, a lot of work goes into these materials, and this isn't a kind of frivolous on, on my part in trying to promote the notion of openness, um, but open means that you actually have a legal protected uh, way of sharing your materials. So it's not just there's the legal system and then there's no system. No, not at all. We're, we're dealing with Creative Commons open licenses which brings a legal system into this notion of sharing. So we're all about promoting openness and in, in, in foreign language education. Okay, so let me turn it back to our presenters. There was a question about um, new systems and using and, and property rights, uh, intellectual property rights, and things, but I guess that was the answer. And I think the question about intellectual property rights with MOOCs, and I think again it depends on what system you're using, who you're going through to create your MOOC, all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure Coursera has their set, depending on which institution you're with, I mean Udacity has theirs, and it's going to be very specific to where you are and what you're using. Question? Yeah, my chat question got skipped over, but I just had where, where on the screen can you insert these little quizzes if you want to? It's, she's asking about where can you insert the quizzes if you're in Adobe Connect, for example. When you're in teacher mode or, or presenter mode, there's an off-screen presenter area. You have to create a pod, they call it a pod, that is the quiz, you can set it up ahead of time with your questions and the answers, and then when it comes time to show it, you just enable it and stick it on screen. So you won't see it there while you're in, while you're viewing us now, but when you actually get into Adobe Connect, there is a quiz pod that you would create. All right. Good. So. Throughout this, we've got what we call back burners, and these are not questions that we're going to go through, but they're things that we'd like you to read these um, and then think about them throughout the day, throughout the next couple of weeks. Um, this back burner is just reflect on what we just did. We used a little formative quiz, and then we used a text chat, um, and then we followed it with a discussion and a bit of a recap. So. Think about this in terms of online teaching and learning. Does this kind of way of working with your class suit what you're going to be doing? Is it a strategy you might use? Just think about it. There's, there's no answer. It's not a right or wrong. Just getting you to do some meta-thinking about what we're doing. So we're going to proceed on to A for Analyze. And here's where we get into our technological chaos. Yes. <laughs> All right, at this point, because we would like to try and use audio in some breakout groups online, what we're going to ask everyone here in the room to do is leave the room, the, the digital room, unless you have headphones. If you have headphones, you can participate in an audio chat with the online participants. But if you don't have headphones, it's, it's, it's going to be too much feedback. So you log out by just closing. Just closing the window. Yep. 
One other caveat here, those of you who are adding your headphones at this point, sometimes the computers will switch over and sometimes they won't. You may have to go out anyway and come back in with your headphones already plugged in. So we'll see what kind of feedback loops we get into here. But for those of you who do not have headphones, please leave the room in that way. Yep, there's one. <laughs> so let's tell you what you're going to be doing. You've got 12 minutes where you're going to go through the uh, eight questions that we have here. There's no way you're going to get through eight questions that have as many parts to it as these do. So as you grow into your, your group, and how many of you here are not going to do Adobe Connect? This is just for the face-to-face -face people. OK, could you sort of migrate over and discuss this, but amongst yourselves face-to-face -face orally in some part of the classroom, maybe up over here? Um, and we're getting feedback again. All right. Um, if you're using the PDF, you will notice that these are the questions that are bolded. Uh, so we only want you looking at those. When you get into your group, the first thing you need to do is, is choose a group leader who's going to keep you moving forward. And that person is going to get to choose the questions that you're going to look at. Uh, you just need to do that because otherwise there won't be enough time. The other thing is you need to choose a reporter because the reporter is going to be taking notes and is going to consolidate everything that you discuss over the next 12 minutes and put it into a one-minute report. Okay, So you have 12 minutes to get in and talk about the questions, discuss with each other, and then you've got about three minutes to work with the reporter to come up with what is the one minute of most important stuff that you can tell us about your 12-minute discussion. <laughs> so you've done some pondering, and hopefully we haven't laid any eggs here. Um, which, all right, so now what we're going to do, if we were entirely online, you would bring everybody back into your synchronous session and have a person doing reports. Because of the logistics of what we're doing here and the, the feedbacks and so on, what we're going to do is ask those of you who were online um, in a group participating online, okay, you're so going to report for your group. And why don't we start, however, with one of one or two of the um, groups who were face to face, and could we get the reporter to please come up here? Okay, so our group had um, myself and a colleague from the Classics Department and a colleague from the German Department, all of whom teach language courses that share the fact that we're not really interested in conversation or buying railway tickets or ordering a beer, whatever. Um, so our interests are important. probably <laughs> different than, than many. Um, and what we are interested in is developing a class that will use technology to help us break down geographic accessibility age barriers, not so much in scaling the experience to a huge size. We're thinking of classes that will be basically the same size as a residential bricks and mortar class. Um, and we see technology, that, that's where technology can help us because we'll still be the teacher, we'll still be their teaching. Um, we're also interested in developing um, the format, the basic format, that will help keep the same quality in every section of the class as we currently have a, a basic template, if you will, 
for all sections of the same level of the class. We want the same sort of flexible format that will maintain the quality, maintain the same pace in the class, but will also allow the person who is teaching the class, who steps in and takes over that format, to be able to run the class as the teacher, as the instructor of record, um, in their own in their own way. Um, and one of the motivating factors for the classics department, at least, is to keep quality, the same quality as we have in our residential class. Thank you so very much. And we get someone, can one of the two of you please come up to explain? What your group came up with? Um, I teach uh, in chemistry. And it's very likely that in each group, completely different kinds of questions were discussed. So it would be a very broad ranging set of reports. Um, so, Ni, introduce yourself then. Ni um, Afalavi, I'm an associate professor in Spanish and Portuguese and African and African diaspora studies. Um, I teach uh, intermediate Yoruba. Uh, we have two Yoruba courses. Yoruba, by the way, is a language spoken in, in West Africa, in Nigeria specifically, and also in, um, in the diaspora, such as AD. Uh, those where, where um, religion, you know, African religion has been hybridized, so to say. The, so on the, the, we, we try to deal with um, Actually, maybe the first question for each each of the three groups uh, on context, learners, and content. Um, the basic challenge for us um, is issue of enrollment, the number of students, and um, the the type of students that we get here on campus. They are mostly heritage students, which means their interest beyond the institutional uh, expectation of fulfilling the language requirement is socialization, relieving you know, that cultural heritage that they've lost or they are trying to grapple with, either because they were born abroad in Nigeria and they grew up here in the US and now they are studying. So while at home, even though the parents will have loved to, um, to instill you know, that language or force them to learn it, um, I guess English somehow, you know, um, has taken the has become the, the mother tongue, so to say, it has replaced it. So they were unable to to use that language, and as, as, as adults now, they are feeling a sense of loss in about who they are, issue of identity. So the the, the so I call it. I say I keep repeating heritage students because that's what you get. Mostly they are heritage students. So they, have, they are coming um, from a whole school of thought in terms of expectation. Uh, expectation. Yes, they want to fulfill the requirement, but they also the, the requirement also have different levels for different colleges. So you have a situation where you can start out with about 20 students in, at the, at the uh, beginning level. OK. So, <laughs> so context, <laughs> institutional. <laughs> Institutional expectation um, is negotiated because they are specifically heritage students. So in addition to the requirement, they also want to relieve their spirituality and identity issues. Okay. That goes for the learner. So you have the learner. And that also connects with the content. The content has to be kind of culture-based, performance-based, and also attempt at performance. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. So while Catherine's queuing up the next person, I'm just going to talk because uh, I wanted to say a couple things about what Nii just said. He mentioned uh, less commonly taught languages and Nii uh, is a professor of Yoruba language and culture and then is representing the LICTL as the acronym for less commonly taught languages, the, that community. Um, and he mentioned, uh, of course, the issue of enrollment and heritage speakers, um, and many people in the LICTL community are turning to technology to help them with those issues because of, of low enrollment. So uh, technology, of course, is a way of bringing lots of people together who may be in, um, you know, dispersed. 
So, Jeanette, you want to talk about what your group talked about? Hi. Um, okay, oh, okay, so okay. I was recording for an online chat group. My name is Jeanette Okor, and I teach Turkish here at UT. Um, we had four people in our group, but only three of us were successfully able to communicate. Um, Patricia, can you hear me out there? <laughs> Patricia was the fourth person whose microphone was not working very well. So unfortunately, we weren't able to learn anything about uh, where she is and what she does, except for Nancy seemed to know her. Uh, as they were chatting about personal stuff. Um, anyway, we had people teaching French, ESL, and Turkish um, at UT. Um, and uh, we first looked at question one. Um, I should say, actually, that half of our time was probably eaten up with trying to find each other and uh, understand each other and turn our microphones on. So the quality of our, the depth of our discussion took a while to get going compared to the face-to-face -face groups. Um, anyway, uh, in, start, in institutional parameters, uh, one of the three of us uh, in the ESL program uh, said that his uh, program is able to determine their own parameters for the online courses. Um, and he had a more specific idea of exactly what he was going to be teaching, uh, for whom, with what goals in mind. Um, um, and so that he would be designing the course following, um, following along with a writing textbook. Um, that course goals was basically to bring Saudi Arabian students' writing and spelling skills up to par before they arrive at UT. So um, very clear parameters and goals, I think. Um, Nancy, who's talked about French, said that the institutional parameters for their beginning uh, intensive online French uh, sequence um, seems to change every week. Um, and uh, one thing that she and I had in common is that our courses, uh, mine is even more nebulous, but uh, that we would be expected somehow to teach all four communicative skills via online, via the online course, and um, how to deal with um, speaking, uh, and especially s assessing uh, speaking proficiency is probably the most complicated part of that. Um, uh, her content was clear in that she's expected to deliver the entire regular intensive French course just like the bricks and mortar course, um, which is also very much online anyway, um, uh, via web conferencing. Um, mine is the case of these lesser yeah, products. Nice. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <seconds. laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, like Carl was talking, mine is more of a case of trying to bring uh, students um, together from different universities um, to even make up an intermediate or adult uh, or intermediate or advanced Turkish course. Great. Okay, that's it. Hi, I'm Rachel. I was. Uh, listening in on a, um, or participating in one of the online groups. And I apologize if I misrepresent anybody's ideas. I was kind of jumping in and out. But um, it was an interesting group, a diverse group. We had um, Abigail, who's here at UT, working on developing a Russian course. And she's also within the French department, so she's familiar with French Interactive, which is a website that we're working on at Coral. And we're working on transitioning that into a set of materials for an all online course. We have Josh, who works at the Center for Teaching and Learning here at UT. And he works on online courses with um, all different faculty from across the university, so not just languages. So he um, uh, was bringing a different perspective. And then we had Neil, who uh, is, a, is a learner, an online language learner. And then Caroline, who was actually wanting to develop an online course for Arabic to teach to 10 to 14 year olds. So unfortunately, she got she got, had connection issues, and we weren't able to, to talk with her as much about that. But I think that would be that's a very interesting context to be dealing with. Um, some of the things we talked about. Um, Josh was talking about working with some of the other faculty. You know how to get past the typical boring e-learning design that you know is kind of the, the 
lowest common denominator for e-learning, and he was talking about a faculty member that was really interested in scenario-based learning, which I don't know too much about, but Abigail sort of made the connection between that and, and communicative language teaching, which is, of course, um, a big focus, and being able to, her, her goal was to, to be able to have learners express new ideas in the L2 to each other, so not just recycling, but having those, those new ideas. And we talked a little bit about communication methods and asynchronous communication, the need for a forum or some type of an asynchronous. So, that's interesting. Great. All right. So, we've done an, an online discussion. Number one, yes, there were technical issues. There are going to be technical issues. At the beginning, there are going to be a lot of technical issues. Um, and we're going to talk about how to deal with some of that using orientations. Um, but I, <laughs> I, I, it wasn't the day of the hurricane, but there was something where people were coming in and out with connectivity. And you just need to learn to roll with it. You take some stress pills and just deal with it. Um, those of you who were having problems with uh, the oral part, you could have communicated. There's a text chat. And actually, one of the things I found is that my students very quickly, when they can't be participating orally, they're down there text chatting like crazy. So that band is always available to you and your students. Keep that in mind. There are always workarounds. Um, the other thing is, everyone who came up here Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. But imagine a basic online language course where you're doing this. You're not going to get students, at first, willing to speak for a full minute in target language, right? Uh, we had all professors here. Professors talk, <laughs> so there was a lot of production going on. Don't be expecting that when you've got your real students, um, and the kind of tasks that you're giving them have to be ones that they can handle at their proficiency level. Every day before you go in and teach, go and read what novice level proficiency in oral production is if you're doing a synchronous session. Go back and read that. Keep your reality quotient. Um, and then make sure as you're designing that you're designing tasks that are going to allow them to work in target language but at their proficiency level, all right? Just a, a few things there. So our back burner is for you to reflect on using discussion groups during a synchronous session. We did this with Adobe Connect. How effective was it? How effective can you imagine it being when you're doing your language, and it's a basic level language, or you know maybe German for specific purposes, how effective would this kind of synchronous chatting be? Um, and then just start thinking about how you could do this sort of discussion work outside of a synchronous class session. You could have your students doing this on Skype and recording it so that you could watch it later. Google Hangout recording it so you could watch it later. FaceTime, I'm not sure. I suppose you can record it. What, whatever. There are other means of having students working synchronously in the target language, discussing, and it doesn't have to all be synchronous in a classroom like Adobe Connect. Just throwing out there are a lot of different modalities. You need to think these through when they're appropriate. Um, but also, what kind of preparation? Do you know how long it took us working <laughs> with a number of people to make sure this could happen? And we still ran into huge technological snafus, given our reality quotient. I think it through. So that's just your back burner. And you get to think about this back burner and the one that we asked just before because you get a break now. But you break because you are professors and talked <laughs> longer. You ate into your um, break time. So I think we have maybe seven or eight minutes. Let, let's come back. Ready to go by 22. Yeah, be ready to go by 20 minutes until. Uh, 11. And Rachel, did you have something there, we needed to say? Um, oh, two comments. Yes. Um, Abigail was saying that the hardest thing she has experienced uh, in teaching ESL online is that she has to really monitor how much 
she's speaking versus the student production. Could you say that again, please? <laughs> um, Abigail is reporting in the chat room that one of the hardest thing in teaching ESL online is to really monitor how much she's speaking versus the student's production. Okay, welcome back. Hope you had a good short pause. <laughs> um, so we're back and what we're doing now, we've got this not working. Uh, okay, we're going to take a look at some actual design models. We're going to look at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, the things that I produced uh, for the French program and I did an entire first and second year set of courses. We're going to take a look at my colleague Bob Godwin Jones's, but very quickly because I don't actually have access to his things. But what he's doing is making it mobile, which is so exciting. Um, then Marlene's going to talk about the University of Minnesota. Then we're going to go and take a, a quick look at Carnegie Mellon's uh, language courses. Um, and I want you to keep in mind as we look at Carnegie Mellon, there, well, well, we'll look at it, but Carnegie Mellon has now, is now partnering in a research partnership with Google to be working on MOOCs and MOOC data to improve uh, learner learning. It's very interesting. Please read up on what they're doing because this is where we're going with big data and uh, some possibilities of exciting things in the future. And then we're going to look at the University of Maryland University College, which is a huge program. And we'll get into the specifics of that when we get into it. So first of all, we're going to take a look at VCU. And I'm at Virginia Commonwealth University. It's a, an urban public university, the largest in the state of Virginia. We have over 32,000 students. Um, the upper administration, our president, he's not that new anymore, but was deliberately brought in because he had developed the uh, Central Michigan online programs. And so the board was really looking for someone who would be supporting the moving into 21st century uh, teaching and learning modalities, as well as doing a lot with research. I am in the School of World Studies, which is where languages are housed with uh, anthropology, international studies, uh, religious studies, quite a few different departments. And we deal with global affairs. However, my administration that we have now does not believe in basic online language learning. They think it's not possible, which is interesting. And they also don't think it's effective, which is interesting. Um, so they're in direct contradistinction to our whole upper administration. Um, the French 101-102 online has to stay in sync with the regular face-to-face -face courses. So I have to use the same materials. I have to use the same syllabi and pacing, which is fine so that students can come in and out of face-to-face -face and online programs seamlessly. Uh, we have Blackboard Collaborate, which I use, or Blackboard with Collaborate, which I use. But I am free to use any and all media that I want to. Uh, so I do try to build in a lot of different social media. And uh, just about how it was done, I was part of the Provost Initiative for Online Learning when it first came out. I was given summer workshops, but I've been actually teaching hybrid since 1997. Um, so I have a lot of materials, and being able to transition into teaching entirely online wasn't that foreign to me because I'm a geek. Um, for a lot of people, that's not the case. Um, I think it was given maybe a 1000 bucks, And I was only supposed to create one course, but I went ahead and created four. <laughs> so I did 101, trialed it, and then the next semester I fixed it. And then I went and did uh, the 101 and the 102. And then by the summer, I did the 201. And by the next fall, I had a 202. So I had the whole sequence. But they really only expected me to do one. But I am who I am. Um, so let's take a look at it. This is from one of the courses. And I took uh, Quality Matters. And you'll notice that there's a button. The first one is Announcements, which is a really important page. But um, the Start Here and Help is something that we learn in Quality Matters. You really need a button. You need a place where your students can go when they're having difficulties. And we're going to take a look at a minute with that. Um, the rest of these are pretty common Blackboard uh, tabs. So in my Start Here and Help button, um, I 
start out with welcoming them, welcoming them to the online uh, situation. But I also explain it's not for everybody, that it is going to be, it's going to take a little bit more for them to do this and explain why. Then I give them a readiness thing. Now, here was one of my first mistakes that I kept doing for two semesters and then I finally got smacked so hard that I knew it wouldn't work. Uh, I expected my students, I send them out a letter about two and a half weeks before the course starts and I say, this is an online course. This is what you need to know. You know, I introduce myself in this email and uh, I say, you've got things you have to do before classes start. Yeah, right. They're not going to. Classes start on a specific day and we have ad drop for, I think it's uh, close to 10 days. And a lot of students don't think you really have to start a course until the end of ad drop. And you need, as an online professor, to know that this is going on because your first couple of days, that orientation period, is so important, but you're going to have people who are coming in unless you set up the policies that that doesn't happen. But we'll, we'll talk more about that as time goes on. Um, and then where it says start using Blackboard here, I show them all of the different parts that they're going to be um, using in this course, the Blackboard, the uh, Pearson materials, which were the ones that we were using at the time. Um, all of the different elements and I give them jings so that they can watch the little videos that show them on screen with screen captures how to use these different things, where to go, what it looks like because these are these people are not readers. You need to know this about Gen D, um, Gen X, whatever they're called now. They don't do a lot of reading but that's your first interface with them is all reading. So you're going to give them lots of things to read they're probably not going to, but if you give them videos, they're, they're, there's more of a tendency that they'll watch videos. Um, then we go into assignments. Assignments have to be really carefully spelled out. Students need to know what they do, have to do by what date and why, in other words, is it going to be on the test. Same thing as you have with face-to-face. -face. They want to know what, what bang they're getting out of their bucket. They do this work. What is it going to count for? So, this kind of specificity, just this has to be really, really clear. So I set mine up week by week. Yes, the question. Mm -hmm. And there are. There are just so many. Um, I gave them whichever one. Our, Oops. Yeah, the question was um, what kind of readiness assessment that I, have I been using because there are a number that are out there and I went and culled through a number of them and then used the one that our C Center for Teaching Excellence had suggested. Um, it actually was too lengthy, uh, but still it's a really good one. And then eventually uh, the second year that I was doing this, I gave up because they weren't doing it. Um, and so I built it in and I'll show you later on, I think it's probably in the afternoon session, I'll show you what I did to make sure that they did some learner ready, readiness things and I built it into Blackboard so that I could quiz them and give them points because otherwise it's not going to happen. I've gleaned it from all around and because this is language learning, which is highly specific, and we're going to look at that when we look at uh, language learners, these are people who do not know the language. So they're novice low in the language. These are people who by and large are not language learners in general. They have not learned other languages, at least not well, so that they have a facility in learning languages. Novice low. These are people who don't have online learning skills, novice low. And we have to deal with the fact that we're bringing them in all three up through novice low, novice mid, novice high. We're trying to get them up there, but we have to teach them how to do that. We have to coach them and bring them along. That's, 
really, really important to have in our minds as we're doing this designing and uh, developing and uh, the whole shebang. So, um, yes. Ask the question again, because, um, despite the, um, whatever method generation is, um, you know, and it's very Not academic learning. Uh, the question was, uh, you know, that these are our students who are online. If we look at the Pew Center research reports, it's telling us they're online a lot, and especially now with the the smartphones, it's it's even more. They're they're connected 24/7. But that does not mean that they're using it for learning purposes. They may be using it for a quick thing, how to fix the kitchen sink because it stopped. Um, but not for academic kinds of learning. And again, they don't know how to learn languages. And language learning is a very specific uh, mindset that we eventually get into as we learn foreign or world languages. Uh, it's, it's not the same as going in and, and reading texts in uh, an English class and then doing discussions. There's so much more going on. No, actually they are not. The, the, the uh, assumption was that students are better with troubleshooting. And you'll have some who are really good, uh, but a majority, if it's not plug and play, they don't know how to deal with it. And uh, the kinds of things that, that you'll be using in your class if you're using Adobe Connect, I mean, many of you have already used Adobe Connect and saw already this morning. It was not self-evident. There are a lot of intricacies. They will learn it. Again, it starts at novice low, and we're moving them up. So at the beginning, as you're designing, you need to make sure you're not using a lot of new technologies, that you're making it as clear as possible, that you're helping them learn it so that they're not getting frustrated with the, the mediations, because you know they're, they're, you want them into the language, not getting uh, frustrated with the technology. So that's, that's a part of your design process, is to think that through. Oh, and I've got 10 seconds to finish. <laughs> All right, we're really breezing through uh, VCU. Um, I give them regular assignments through the, the My French Lab, and then I can use that to, uh, as we go into synchronous sessions, to take a look at where they've been having problems and then target that and then do. I do, uh, if it's a, a five credit or four, yeah, it's a four, five credit course, um, I do five hours, no, I do four hours with them synchronously. So they're getting a lot of synchronous time and a lot of, of uh, work. I also give them, uh, they, they had to do voice pals and it, this didn't work, but it's, it's because I didn't work it out sufficiently um, because I was trying to use the mixer and you don't get enough stable partners for that. But um, the next time I do this, I will contract with another university in another country and make sure that that teacher and, and I have um, specific goals and work that our students do together over the time so that they can have these tele-exchanges with uh, real students in real time. And I also give them chats and blogs. I also give them active learning. So this was an extra normal thing where they, they set up um, discussions. With, they had to create dialogues. And the nice thing is, and I know I'm so over time, um, it, it lets them write their dialogues and then hear good French because it's like Siri. It takes what's written and it translates it into voice. And it, the French is excellent. The pronunciation is really, really good. So they work on that. They get to hear what their words would sound like in good French. Um, and of course, we work on the writing before I have them put that in there. Uh, and then later, when we're in synchronous session, they have to do their own dialogue with each other. But they've heard it so many times, they've worked on it, and it's good pronunciation. Um, it's, it's a really good use of, of target language and orality. These are my online synchronous sessions. They're all archived, so they can go back at any point, which I found the students use enormously. 
They love to be able to go back in the archive to especially those lessons, passé composé, whatever it is, where they really had problems and listen to it again. So it's, it's really powerful that not only do they get the online work, but then it's archived and they can go back to it. Um, and this is what it would look like in, uh, this was the older version because we had Wimba Live Classroom. Now we've got Wimba Collaborate. And this is what it would look like. And throughout this, uh, these were all things where we were talking. And it was you know, going back and forth. And then the place where it says uh, recipes in the salon, that those are their discussion rooms where they would uh, talk mm -hmm. to each other. Oh, sorry. I, yeah, discussions. Um, in the discussion sections sessions. So I did want to get us to Bob Godwin Jones, and I don't have time. So I'm going to tell you to please go look at what Bob is doing. He is just amazing. But at any rate, you can now use Soft Chalk if you have access to that to create your mobile online. And it creates the e-texts that connect into everything and have the audio and the video. So your students have it on their tablets, on their phones, on their computers. And it is just amazing. Um, go and take a look at his German stories um, and his uh, websites, because Bob is just awesome. And he's making it mobile. And it's really, really exciting. So that's VCU in a nutshell. Oops, sorry. Yes. And you've got it. You've got the URL in the chat. Okay. It's in the chat, and it's on the PDF, and it's on the slides, which you have access to all of this. And Marlene, you're on. I'm actually just going to talk you through a couple of things quickly, because mm -hmm. these are not my courses, but I wanted to give you some ideas of a couple of other models. Um, Catherine's were all synchronous. Mm -hmm. So she you know, did a regular, what, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, mm -hmm. synchronous. Everybody had to be there at the same time. The Spanish at University of Minnesota is asynchronous. So they don't meet together as a class all at the same time. They're working online um, through, uh, we have Adobe Connect that Francis uses for individuals. Or I think she leaves the room open so that students can come in if they're working on a partner activity or something just on their own. But all her materials are in a Moodle. That's the word I'm looking for, a Moodle site. And the activities are there. And there are ways to do voice recordings and that sort of thing. But she also has them working outside in pairs through Skype or Hangouts, whatever they're comfortable with. Um, the interesting thing, and this is a little bit of the backstory that I wanted to tell you about since you're thinking about doing developing and designing some things. The Spanish department was not the one that instigated this. The University of Minnesota has been a little bit slow in terms of putting things online. Um, our health program has a whole program that's completely online, but the language departments haven't been there. It was actually our CCE, our College of Continuing Education, that was getting requests from students who wanted the online courses because of the flexibility and scheduling and doing it in your pajamas and that whole thing. So Continuing Education asked for help from Francis, who is the woman I work with who in the Spanish department, to help create some online courses for Spanish. CCE does a lot of their stuff online because that's their purpose, this, the continuing education thing, to try and get in contact with people who are geographically dispersed across our state and whatever. They have the money, the programmers, the instructional designers, and the expertise to put these courses together. And they did. And with Francis's help, um, they used a couple of other things. They added in activities to they're using the Pearson My Spanish Lab. Um, so publisher materials, but with additional activities outside of that to do this completely asynchronously for the most part. Okay, doke. Would ask you the URL of that <laughs> it's um, the Spanish class is passworded. It's a private because mm -hmm. there are students in it, so I can't show it to you. So I, I apologize for that. I should have maybe taken some screenshots, but for student privacy and stuff, I, I can't go in. 
All right. So now we're going to look at a different uh, model. The asterisk up there is to remind me to tell you to read about Carnegie Mellon and the Moodle, uh, or the, the not the Moodle, the Google. Um, Carnegie Mellon has the uh, Open Language Initiative, which is pretty amazing, large with lots mm -hmm. of grant money. Over several years, they've been developing it and continue to develop it because they keep having money come in. They have a team of instructional designers. They have instructional technologists. They have committed faculty who get to work on nothing but that. They had a great idea, which we'll take a look at in just a minute. They have constant updates that are based on the evaluations. And uh, did I mention they had a lot of money? That's an important part. So we're going to go take a look at it. And uh, you can get in and get your own account. So anybody who's here, if you want to go ahead and do this with me, you can, you can go on and get your own account because they're free. And I'm going to sign in. I've got to remember who I am. I think that's who I am for them. And uh, there is a part of this that you can sign in for them, right? Well, no, if, even if you're going to do it uh, as a freebie individual, uh, you still have to get an account and sign in. Uh, after I did that, I looked at their list of free courses, and I went and chose the language ones, because I believe we had somebody from American English. Uh, and so I, I pulled that one down just to show you that it's there. The Arabic. Uh, which is a very interesting course, but we're going to go into the uh, elementary French because it's the one I've worked with most frequently. Um, this is open and free. This course students can use individually. If as a faculty member you decided that you wanted this as a part of your course, then you have to contract with Carnegie Mellon as a faculty member and purchase it. So this is part of how they get their revenue stream for it. Um, and Old Dominion University, for mm -hmm. example, uses a textbook and this within their uh, Blackboard. And that's their course. They have their own specificities to it. But in, by and large, they're using this, um, uh, the, the French, uh, elementary French, as their learning mm -hmm. materials. So one gets information for the users, and then you get into the communication. And there's, there's quite a bit that's explained about how this goes on. And then you get these lovely little videos. Bonjour, Laurent. Bonjour, Monsieur Durand. Comment allez-vous? Très bien, merci. Et vous? Comme ci, comme ça. Bon, au revoir. Okay, and then they do they do a lot of work with this. So yeah, that was really short and, and sweet, but then they do a lot of work with it. And sometimes it's subtitled, and uh, sometimes it's translated. And just depending on where you are within your learning trajectory, you get the different facets that you need. Um, there's a vocabulary area with the mot et expression that will also work on this. There's a lot of oral work in there. So you can listen to it, and uh, it'll be the same thing. Bonjour, Madame Morin. Bonjour, Monsieur Durand. Comment allez-vous? Très bien, merci. Et vous? Comme ci, comme ça. Bon. Au revoir. Bonjour. Au revoir, Madame Morin. And then you can, you can just you can hear Bonjour. the individual ones, mm -hmm. and it works on that. Then it works on structures. So this is a language course, and they have first year and they have second year. Um, the thing that I one of the things I really like about this course is everything that students do, data is being collected on it. And you can see as, as students are working on something, do they have to go back to this in order to understand that? So Carnegie Mellon is getting information on the learning as it's happening. And over time, they're able to say, oh, well, it looks like we really need to fix this module because, or this part of this module, because the students are having problems with it, and they're having to click, and it's taking x amount of time when it really should take y. So let's go back and look at the design phase. So there's a great deal of evaluation built into this, which is why I think Google is partnering with them, is because they're pulling out big data 
on learning. So that's pretty exciting, and you can use it. Yes? You're talking about the data that they're getting. Um, can they do research on that data? Mm -hmm. Is there an IRB process that they go through? Um, I think in some instances, if, if it's your own data, they give it to you, and then you would have to deal with that because that's your student's data and you've contracted with them. Uh, when they get the data from your students, um, it gets scrubbed as to student identifiers. So they can use it in the, in the big data sense. And I'm sure they have their own IRBs, but it, there, there are no research subjects when it gets to this point because they're not identifiable. Okay. Yeah. No, no. Now the thing is, if, if you um, did not want this as a backbone within your course, you could still let your students go into this as individuals, but uh, you would see as you go through this, um, if you go to take any of the tests, it's not going to give you the feedback. So you don't get the, the assessment that somebody who's paying for it gets. And I think as an instructor, if you wanted this really core within your uh, platform, you're going to want to pay for it. And it's not an onerous amount of money. It's, you know, it comes out per student, and, and you could actually charge it to the students and have them. Like, there are different ways of getting it paid for. Um, <coughs> it's like a textbook. And it really, it, I think it costs uh, quite a bit less than any of our regular textbooks. Pretty performative. It's something I'd look at if, if they have something that um, is in your field of interest, and that's Carnegie Mellon. And here's that's the only language course in the office. is the French, and then they have well they have the Arabic, and then they have oh. some English with, it, but the English is only for pronunciation. And you think the Arabic is more cultural? Yeah. The well, Arabic is the, limited. Yeah, well, that's the only basic online language course that they currently offer. So right. You can do it for free, but there is a paid version that has, you can do as a teacher with a class. But you can just go by yourself, and it's free. Mm -hmm. All righty. So do we have any questions coming from anybody online? No? Not at the moment. All right. Now we're going to yet another model. This is the University of Maryland uh, University College. They work with working adults. They have a large military and government population. They have a global student body. And when I say global, I mean global. They've got people learning in Afghanistan. They have people on ships in the middle of some ocean somewhere. 24-7, um, so I mean, it's at any time during any day. They may be seeking a degree, maybe not. It depends. They have 78, not language students, but they have 78,000 students worldwide. They work in eight-week terms. The language offerings are Spanish, German, French, Japanese, Chinese, and Arabic. And they have 1,700 enrollments in, annually in online language courses. It's a big program. It's a very big program. They have 50 faculty and TAs who are involved in this. Um, their model is a cohort. That means that the students come in at the beginning of eight weeks and they work together during those eight weeks. So it's not a self-paced model. Uh, it's not an independent learning model. Something like the Carnegie Mellon, if you do it as an individual, uh, would be an independent model. You can dip in and out as, as you want. They have weekly assignments that are due. There's the cohort. They have one-on-one -on -one, uh, synchronous speaking practice and student work that's possible. But they cannot have any synchronous sessions because their people are 24-7, and they may actually be moving time zones as the class is going on. And there are other issues with their people who are a lot of military. They have a cap of 24 people in the language classes. And I believe Gretchen said it's very similar to mine, that a lot of people start out, but there is a large attrition rate. Um, but not quite as much as there is with uh, 
for example, my courses, which are synchronous, and I'm expecting them to do a lot of oral work. Um, they have the language assistants uh, dedicated for eight to nine hours a week. Um, students are required to have a microphone. Again, it can't be synchronous. Um, also, the, their students, because they're on ships and in military installations and in government uh, diplomatic areas, they can't require them to download any software, so it all has to be web-based. Everything that they use has to be web-based, um, and they have to, the students have to be able to access the materials, and the students can't use a scanner or a camera because of the sensitivity of things that might be going on in their environment. So a very interesting set of things, design issues. Um, their vision is that they do all four, all four skills in all three modes. Um, they do work on interaction. They engage the students uh, in language learning strategies. And they acknowledge adult learners, which is important because that's their community. That's their, their uh, learner profile. So how do they get the engagement? They have the materials that they used are, are asynchronous and one way. So the student is sitting there with my French lab just doing their work. Mm -hmm. They get the immediate feedback from the, uh, the online uh, student activity manual or whatever. Um, and that's pretty easy on the instructor because it's run through the textbook company. But then they also believe in having the interactivity. So they look towards uh, Paloff and Pratt's notion of online learning, that there should be interactions among students, between faculty and students, and that uh, the collaboration and learning comes from all of the interactions. So in order to get collaborative learning, um, they have the instructor-student synchronous exchange. And you'll see that's three times in an eight-week term. So they actually are together with their students three times in an eight-week term. Mm. Um, but then they have the TAs who work four times during the eight weeks synchronously with the learner. They have students practice. Um, I think they do small groups. I think the TAs do maybe two, three, at most four people in a group synchronously. Yeah. They have peer practice where the students work together, a uh, minimum of twice in an eight-week session. Um, then they have Wimba voice board or voice thread, which is asynchronous oral work, but the students are listening to each other um, and speaking. Uh, it's just asynchronously. And then they have the asynchronous written exchanges. So. It's a model if you have to do a completely asynchronous course. And it does get some actual language interactivity synchronously going on, which is important. Um, they also do a lot of evaluation. And one of the things that they do, and I won't go into this right now, is they have a list of can-do statements to get students thinking about what they can do and where they're going to be able to do as they move along their language learning trajectory. Um, and they use their thinking of using student um, portfolios, e-portfolios, eventually for a part of their assessing student progress. So if you have questions about this, please go and ask Gretchen Jones. She is the academic director of this whole program, but she also now is uh, the assistant dean for the college that does all of this work. So she really has a good handle on what's going on in this type of design and delivery format. So back burner. Which of these designs, because we've looked at a few of them, um, most resembles the kind that might be suited to your experience or different bits and pieces? And what parts of it would you copy? What would you definitely improve upon? Because I know mine could use a lot of improvement. Um, and what could you change? And what would you avoid, like the plague? I did want to mention one other thing. A lot of people talk about using Rosetta Stone. And James Madison University, um, not the foreign language department, but their continuing education, uh, has Rosetta Stone as the backbone and they do give credit 
possibly to students who go through and use the Rosetta Stone. It's, it's a, a very highly fraught issue. And the language faculty had absolutely nothing to do with what the continuing education people did with this Rosetta Stone. Um, it has quite a bit to do with the fact that Rosetta Stone is in the backyard of uh, James Madison University. But um, I would not throw Rosetta Stone out with a baby with the bathwater. My son used Rosetta Stone to supplement um, his Arabic course because one of them didn't have a lot of speaking. And when he went into the one that did, he needed a lot of, of work, and uh, particularly vocabulary work. And Rosetta Stone was very helpful to him. So things like Rosetta Stone have a place, but to use Rosetta Stone, um, I don't know. There, there was a study that came out, and because of a lawsuit, was retracted. But the uh, National Foreign Language Center did a study. And what was reported back then, and I'm just reporting what was reported back then, is that Rosetta Stone talks about how many people are using Rosetta Stone. But the actual number of people who actually ever finish even one level is quite low. And I won't say any more about that. Um, you don't need any but that's still on their own, independently. And that's not using Rosetta Stone within a classroom setting. So I know some people are using Rosetta Stone as a support, and it may well have its place. It's it's. I, I say to my students, use whatever works for you. So I do give them links to Rosetta Stone. And as I said, it, it's, it's got some support issues. I, I don't know now where Rosetta Stone is. I know that they bought out um, Live Mocha. And I used to quite support Live Mocha because it gave the students, you know, I wanted them to do online oral work with, with pairs and people they don't know. And Live Mocha provided that, which I think is part of the reason that uh, Rosetta Stone bought up Live Mocha. They also now have bought up Tell Me More. And Tell Me More I've used over the years, and it has some very good features to it. So I'm waiting to see what the integration of Rosetta Stone with Tell Me More and Live Mocha is going to bring about. Because those two are very powerful and, very, and have certain interactivities that are very powerful. So it all waits to be seen. We're all getting better. And I'm not defending them, but for a couple of years, They've also had an online practice mm -hmm. with a live oh, that's tutor. True. That's true. They have. Yeah. So they're thinking about it. They were at Calico this year, and they were very interested in what language teachers had to say about what they were doing. They listen. Whether mm -hmm. they will change what they do, don't know. But they're very interested in, in listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a problem with their very basic premise that you learn a language, you learn a second language the same way you learned your first. But I think any of us who have studied second language acquisition, we know that's not the case. So, But that doesn't mean that they still couldn't have built some really good and useful things. And lots of people don't have good philosophies of language learning or teaching. So back burner, keep a look at that. And what we're going to do now, um, you have a sheet on your no. handout. Yes. So I'm going to go take a look at that. This is what it looks like. Um, and we're going to take a look at some materials. And what we'd like you doing um, when we finish looking at the materials is kind of thinking about um, what instructional goal could you use these for? for your students, when's it appropriate, 
and who is involved in these activities that you could construct with some of the materials that we're going to take a look at. So we're in looking at developing some materials and hopefully these are going to work today. They were, everything was working yesterday. You have access to all of these links. Many of them are just the tools themselves, but mixed in with them are some examples of what teachers have actually done. All right, this is Animoto. This is something that you can create in and give your students links to. Um, it's also something where you can ask your students to go and create a little presentation. So let's take a look at what, this is Joe Tarantino from Kennesaw State and he uses this in his Spanish courses. <laughs> Sweet, but definitely something that an instructor can put together relatively easily for a class. I mean, it could be a little bit longer, but also as a model. And definitely something that students can do and students love to do. They like making little things like this. I just wanted to say that it is only the visuals and text. Mm -hmm. You can't do voice overlay with these. That's the one piece I wish they could do. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't. But if you can put in music, you could put in a voice, a voice recording. A voice recording. Okay. So you could do a voice recording. Yeah. So that was one. And the other one that I wanted to show you, sorry? Free, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, all of these that are on Joe's list are all free, if I'm not mistaken. So this other one is another, which is called Vokey. And hopefully the oral part's going to work. Hola, chicos. Feliz Navidad. Sabes que hace mucho frío en mi casa. Por eso me voy de vacaciones en barco con mi esposa. No tengas miedo. Regresaré antes de la Navidad. <laughs> so, again, this is something that can easily and quickly be put together. Um, what you do is you choose your avatar and then you record what you want them to do and you can tell them to do this. Um, it's very much like extra normal where people can go and make little gestures so you can program in the gestures. It's really a lot of fun. Oh, no gestures on Vokey. So extra normal has gestures. I haven't played with Vokey, um, but extra normal I've used and it's but extra normal goes in and out of being free and not being free. So, Can I add a couple? Please. Okay. The Vokies are interesting because you can, like the extra normal, you can type in text and this one pronounces it, which is what it was just doing. That was a typed in text. But you can also record your real voice. Mm -hmm. So you can go either way. Um, it also has a function where you can call it. And with everybody's cell phones not long distance anymore, if your students don't have a mic on their computer, mm -hmm. you can call a phone number and record your voice over the phone to it. No, it, a matter of fact, if you do Chinese characters, it's much better than if you do pinyin, for example. Oh, she was asking if you type it in if it was limited to certain languages. I think. There are, there's a whole list of them. So you have to, to make sure to do it, you know, type in the proper characters and then you set the voice to that particular language. It does pretty well. Mm -hmm. Another question. Does it also do dialect? So this seems to be a standard Spanish uh, for Spain. Yeah. Could you pick uh, Spanish 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 from, Spanish. I don't remember how many of those it's got. Extra normal lets you choose Canadian French. Um, French, French, and there was one other. It wasn't, you know, all of the, it's not like Ivoirian French and, and Ghanaian French, but it, it had more than just French, French. But again, for me, I would have my students record their own voices mm -hmm. and not have it, the text read. So I want to hear them. Well, and I would want to hear them eventually, but 
I found this was really powerful at the 101-102 level where their pronunciation is really hard um, and I like them to type in the words and then hear what they should sound like of their own writing. It just, it really makes a click on going from the, the written to the oral and then um, it also gets them to work a little bit more on pronunciation. So, you know, they're typing in tu va, which has an S on it, and they're not hearing tu vas, they're hearing tu va. And so it, it does work on their pronunciation. Um, so especially at the 101, 102 level, I really like this. Yeah. And then I make them do it on their own. But they get to work on this and hear, hear what their what their words would sound like if they were native speakers. You'd have to test it for your language mm -hmm. and see how good you think it is. But so here's now. You get to choose two. Okay, I had a hard trouble choosing two, but um, I'm going to take you. How many of you are familiar with wikis? A couple online maybe a few more. I really like wikis for collaborative work. Um, mostly written, granted, um, but I've had students do things like research reports and that sort of thing if you're looking at the cultural side of it and putting things together in a wiki. But for those of you who may not have um, an LMS or a course site, a wiki is a really easy way to put up a website and to be able to embed a lot of different kinds of multimedia. So for example, the Vokies that we were just looking at, you can embed in a wiki. Or videos that you pull in from different places, you can embed in the wiki. So it's a nice place of putting things together, um, either for you or for your students, and have it right there on a, on a page rather than linking them out to all sorts of other places. So I really like wikis for kind of the organization that it can do as well as the collaboration that it was built to do. Um, I have the first one here from the Carla Tech PB Works is um, one of our summer, summer institute pages and there is a ton of information here about wikis and there's a couple of examples that I wanted to show you. My mouse is stuck. Here we go. One is, um, let's see if I can find it here. Where's the one that says students in color? I'm not seeing it. <laughs> Language. Oh, here, students in colors. Sorry. I should have highlighted it. This one you can see as each student wrote, they put the text that they wrote in a different color. So it's really easy for the teacher or someone else to go in and look and see, OK, which student wrote what? It's there in colors. And at the very beginning, you'll see that each one, each color is fairly separate. But as time goes on, you'll see they start correcting and adding and changing each other's work. And so you see the colors are mixing up a little bit more. And then they started putting things together. And here's the final essay with all their colors mixed. There is also another way inside the wiki itself to be able to tell which student does what. But it's really nice to be able to see it just bang right there on the page, different colors. Um, I went to the Carla Tech blogs and wikis, the first one there. And that's our yellow wiki, actually. This is where all of my six or seven co-instructors on the Technology Institute put our information and gather it together in a wiki. Again, because it's easy to work in and put it all together. You are welcome to come to this yellow wiki. It's wide open. And we have um, all of the technology tools that we have taught over the years in the Carla Institute, Summer Institute. Mm -hmm. And the information is all listed here. So you're welcome to come back and look at this. But it was the wiki that I just went to. And it was the example of the students in colors. 
And there are a number of other examples here if you want to take a look at other ways that teachers are using wikis for collaborative student work. Um, <coughs> one of the things I play with when I'm teaching language teachers, whoops, go back, um, is Facebook and Twitter. I know there's a lot of um, controversy about that. Not only on our side is it worth it, but on the student side because the students feel like Facebook is their social space and they don't really want their education happening where their social stuff is going on. Um, but I know a number of teachers who have let the students put up a class, a Spanish class Facebook page so that the students themselves get together and ask questions and look at things and collect resources and share YouTube videos they've found about who knows what in the target language. Um, and Catherine and I were just talking about um, the, another little app called Vine that you can use on Twitter. You can record a six, seven, six second movie and post it through Twitter. So there's a lot of things that you could experiment with there. And today's Meet is one that, like the chat room that we're using here in Adobe Connect, if you're talking to your students or especially if you're doing like a lecture of some sort, um, we use it at conferences all the time to do that little side chat to keep track of what's going on. And so your students could do that while you were talking and they could ask you questions or whatever if they didn't necessarily want to talk in front of the whole remote group or whatever. Today's Meet is a nice little back channel chat that you can use that's free. Um, and I think that's as much as I'm going to do. We're getting, getting really short on time and lots of these maybe you've heard about. Oh, no, 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 wait, where's the voice thread? Yeah, you're yeah. going to do voice thread. We have to do voice thread. Do How many of you know about voice thread? Do you have an institutional voice thread yet? We just got it at the University of Minnesota. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> what did I hit? For those of you who are off uh, on, on the webinar, we just lost our screen. It just sort of mysteriously <laughs> up went up ceiling. and went away. Oh, the projector got too So hot. projector is off. And <laughs> okay. Are we back? It'll come. It said something about the projector was cooling down. It's, well, I think we overheated it. If people can look on the screens that are around, we'll, we'll just keep on going. <laughs> Maybe so it will come back the in The screens a minute are still fine. After it cools down. And isn't this amazing? Face to face doesn't work. It, it breaks. The technology of face to face breaks down. And uh, the online so keeps it might on come back. All right. If you are not familiar with VoiceThread, it's a wonderful little tool. You can, you'll have to check on licensing for it. Um, it doesn't tell you that it's free, but if you sign up for a demo account, you will get five free threads. Um, and we've found that if you sign up for one, if your students each sign up for one, then you've got all of the members in your class times five threads that you can use. So there's kind of ways to get around that a little bit. You didn't hear that from me. Um, but VoiceThread is really interesting. Be I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, it's archived. Well, you did hear it from me. <laughs> you can put up um, text, a graphic, a video, and then have students comment on them. And you'll see little icons around the edge. And each one, each comment can be text, audio, video and doodling so you yeah. can scribble on it. Is it back? Yeah. So I don't have to click that again. All right. Um, so here's a couple of exa examples again. I'm going to take you back. Anything that's yellow like this again is our Carla Summer Institute Wiki. And a couple of the examples here I thought were pretty good. Um, actually, can I show you a bad example first? It's one that Joe has here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not going to say it's bad. It has a specific purpose. It's not one that I would do frequently, but here, this example that it's not Joe's example, it's coming from somewhere else. 
Hello. Si te interesa cultivar plantas, ¿qué trabajo puedes hacer? So, it's the teacher who's asking a question about the picture. What if, you know, if you cultivated plants, what work would you be doing? The students could come in then and comment on this. Now, to my way of thinking, this might be good for pronunciation, possibly, but once the first student has answered, what do the rest of the students do? Say the same answer again and again and again and again, all the way through. So I like to encourage teachers when they're doing something with VoiceThread to think about a question or something that you can do with whatever it is you're putting there to get students doing personal opinions, something that will get them answering differently to make it more interesting. Hearing the same thing over and over and over again not only gives the students the answer ahead of time, but it's really boring for the teacher. <laughs> I'm sorry. So it may have a specific purpose. I wouldn't necessarily do it that way. The second one here, though, is another thing that this teacher has done. Um, actually, I don't even need to play that. What she's done is post a graphic of a student's writing, her, a written essay, and she's giving the student oral feedback, which is an interesting way to use VoiceThread. I hadn't seen that one before. Um, on our page, I've got one that I really like here. And this is all in Spanish. So again, I probably won't play this for you, but it's hilarious. What they've done is graphically cut out different people's faces and put them as the student icons. And each student is describing this, particularly, this particular family's scene from that person's point of view. So for example, there's the grandfather who's saying, oh, I'm so happy all my family came to see me on my birthday. And then there's, um, there's another one um, of the little girl, little girl who's saying, all these people are here. I don't really care. They give me lots of hugs, and they smother me, and they smell funny. You know, just, but so they're all giving the scene from a different point of view. So that one I really like. Is there any way that we could actually see that and see the different people's? Um, see if they're, like here's one Yo of them. Yo recuerdo esta foto. Yo soy Rosa. So Mi she can doodle. Do you see the doodle? Le gustaba chuparse el pulgar. So yeah, then the little girl likes to suck her thumb and she pointed at her. So that doodling is something that you can do as you're speaking. You can point out things on the picture. Yeah. They can do it text, audio, audio or video. No. At least not. I mean, you probably couldn't do it for hours, but I've had quite lengthy things recorded and it doesn't asynchronous, right? asynchronous yes because mm -hmm. you would come on your own time and click and listen if you once you click once they just go through all the icons that are there in the order that they are that's one thing it's not good for discussion it's not threaded so just whoever says something the next person who comes in you hear it the next person who comes in you hear it so it's recorded in the order that they recorded them At this point, they can. When you actually create the voice thread, you can tell it no. You can hold back. And it's moder they call it moderation. So all the students can record there as you as the teacher can hear them. It's nice if you've got junior high kids who like to say off-color things, bad words. You can delete them before they get out there. Um, but that way, also, students could all record there as if you were doing a pronunciation or a same answer one, for example. They couldn't hear each other until you released them. So that would, would have been one way to do what that first teacher did, so that they didn't all hear the same thing. OK. There's so much you can do with the voice threads that is really a lot of fun. I would highly recommend that one. And that's right. We were really happy when our university got a site license for it so we can all use it. And it integrated right in, within Moodle. OK. Now I'm done. Next page. All right. So uh, work with somebody, or either work by yourself or if you like to work, work by yourself or work with somebody that you like to work with. And just kind of go through the, the ones that we've shown 
and think about uh, if it's in the interaction mode is synchronous or oral, what would be the instructional goal of what you saw. If you want to go and poke around and look at a couple of others that are just uh, on the list that you have on the PDF, uh, you could go and poke around and look at those or just take the ones that we've shown you and think about when it would be appropriate, who would be doing this activity. Who, just think about it. So go ahead and start trying to, three minutes, go ahead and fill out what you can here. You're on your own, three minutes. Oh, and we do have some activity types and possible tools listed up there if you want to look at those like Skype, Google Hangouts, Blackboard Collaborate. Okay, I'm going to pull you back. I know that was not nearly enough time to even look at one. Um, looking at different tools is a lifetime. You could spend way too much time looking at all the different tools and what they can do. I know because I've done most of that for about the last 20 years. And I don't have enough time to keep up with it even then. Um, but. To finish up here, we're going to go on, well, actually we have a back burner question for you to think about. Which kinds of media or sites provide the greatest opportunities to engage with the target language? And then we've got the three modes there, interpretation, interaction, presentation. 
So depending on which mode you're looking at, you're going to think about different tools that you might want to use for that. And here's an interesting question as well. How are you going to assess their production and give them feedback? When you're in the online environment, that all changes. So that's another thing we need to think through. That's why that one voice thread I thought was really interesting when she was giving oral feedback on the student's written work. That was an interesting one. Oh, sorry. And you do have these to come back to. The links will be there. <laughs> That's all right. I'd like to, in the last few minutes, just go through some best practices and then talk a little bit about social presence. Um, the best practices from teaching online, things that we've run into um, that we think might be helpful as you're jumping into it. And that's my teaching presence, so I'll come back to that. I'm looking at handout seven. If you've got it online, otherwise just listen through and you can have it. You will have it online because you have the link. But just some of the things from this list, um, I tell you where I got the list as well. I did a survey of experienced online language teachers and asked them a number of things about teaching online and ask them for the advice that they would give to new teachers who were starting out teaching online. And many of these um, come from their responses to that as well as my and my colleagues' experience teaching online. So a couple of the things we've discovered. Designing with a consistent, repetitive pattern. This probably goes, many of these probably go just as well for your face-to-face -face classes, but they're particularly important in an online class. So for example, in my online class, I have due dates every Thursday and every Sunday at midnight. And I do the same types of things Monday through Thursday as, and the same types of things Friday through Sunday. And every week it repeats. So the students get into kind of a rhythm and they know what to expect and they have a good idea of what they should be doing. So that consistent, repetitive pattern is an important thing. Um, having the course structure fully delineated before the course starts. I'm laughing because I'm teaching a StarTalk course this summer. We're in week one, and I think we have week up through week three of six developed. And so we're trying to keep track of everything that's happening as the class is going on, as well as trying to figure out what we're going to be doing in the weeks four, five, and six yet. It's crazy. Don't do it. As much as you can, have it all set up ahead of time. That's one of the things online teachers complain about a bit, is that it, because they need to have things all planned out ahead of time, things aren't as spontaneous as they could be in a face-to-face -face class. In a face-to-face -face class, you might run into something that students, you, you find out from their responses that they don't really quite understand what's going on. You can fix it right then. That's a little harder to do when you're doing an online class. And I'll say an asynchronous online class. If you're doing like Catherine does and you're in front of them in a synchronous class, then it's a little bit more like the face-to-face -face class for some of that spontaneity. OK, um, I'm just going to skip a couple of them here. Um, detailed crystal clear guidance system. And one of the things we found very effective with our students was checklists. <clears throat> so what they're supposed to be doing from Monday to Thursday, before we start in all the instructions, we just give them a really quick little checklist. This is the things that you'll be doing this week. And then we go into the detailed instructions. So they have that brief one up there. Again, this is what I have to get done before Thursday type of idea. So we found checklists to be really effective. Clear, intuitive, consistent navigation. Are you hearing some familiar words here? <laughs> So when they go into their course LMS, it should be crystal clear how to navigate through things and where to find things. Um, Catherine had that big orange um, start here button or whatever it was. Very important that they can figure things out easily. A clear, coherent syllabus. One of the things I ran into in my course was when your university specifies you have to have all of this stuff in a syllabus, when you give it to them and hand out on paper. Some of it you can just say, you know, go see the university site. And that's what we did with our syllabus as well, was do a lot of links out to the university requirements. But our syllabus is a contract with the student 
this is what I'm doing, this is what you're doing, all of that needs to be in the syllabus. And it gets a little overwhelming, to say the least. So we've put ours in kind of a book format with chapters on different things, again, to help them find the specific parts of the syllabus that they need, but also just to, so it's not this great huge web page that goes on for miles and miles, to kind of break it up and chunk it. Um, instruction sheets for each activity. This is the one thing that we've found probably the most difficult in teaching online, and that is making your instructions clear to someone else besides you. And that may sound silly, but there are so many things that I have in my head that when I write out instructions, I just kind of do and I don't really think about it. So I always try and pick the least technologically proficient person in my office to test them out for me. Because you never know what's there, what's not there, what you've said kind of oddly or something. But have them check out your instructions because students will have questions and if it's an asynchronous online class, where, who do they ask? We always have a Q&A forum that's right there on the front. They can ask their, post their questions and we say we'll answer them in 12 hours. But if students are doing their homework and it's 10 minutes to 12 on Thursday, within 12 hours isn't soon enough. And your students will expect you to respond 24 hours a day. So that's part of what we say in our syllabus is we have lives. We will respond within 12 hours during the week, 24 hours on weekend to let them know that's part of our contract. I'm not going to answer you within 10 minutes. That doesn't always happen. I'm online constantly. Many times it does happen, but to let them know that it may not. Um, redundancy, you kind of need to, to weigh that one. Um, I find a lot of redundancy confusing because there's too many ways to get to the same place. But my colleague likes to have many different ways to get to the same place because if you're somewhere, you can get there from there and not have to go back somewhere else in order to get there. So you can weigh that one kind of half and half, whatever works best. Um, again, trying out new class components with colleagues. Have them test it out, give you feedback. Um, in ours, it was particularly important for us because ours was an asynchronous course. We needed to let the students know ahead of time that in week five, we're going to have a synchronous section. It will be at this time. We give them a choice of two different times they could come. Just because if they're expecting it to be an asynchronous course, having to be in some place at a certain time, they needed to plan their schedules for that. And we needed to let them know what was going on. Building community is something I'm going to talk about again in just a minute. And monitor, monitor, monitor. In a face-to-face -face class, you know, and they usually always sit in the same chairs, you know who's gone or who hasn't been there for a while. In an online course, it's not easy to tell. And so I have a spreadsheet that I start tracking from before the class starts. Who has responded to me? Who is actually now registered in the Moodle? And I track all the way through. Um, if you can get it Moodle tracking, for example, the different kinds of activities that they do, it'll be in your grade book. You'll see it there. But it's really important because it's easy to lose students in the online space. So track, monitor, monitor, monitor. Watch them. Just to make sure if somebody's been missing for a couple of days, contact them. Communicate with them. We had a student who broke his leg and ended up in the hospital and hadn't been able to tell anybody. But we, you know, if we hadn't been asking, he disappeared for a couple of days. That's how we found out. So you never really know. But communication is really important. Moodle is like Blackboard. It's like you know the different language management systems that, that are out there. So we use Moodle at the University of Minnesota. Um, what have you got here? Canvas and Blackboard. Canvas and Blackboard. Moodle's the same idea. Um, providing prompt and informative feedback. Here again with that kind of 12-hour rule on questions, um, feedback is really important. And we have to train students if they're giving feedback to each other to not just say, good job, but being constructive about it. I liked this part of what you did. And maybe this part you could do a little bit better. Even more important in the online environment. <clears throat> Can I jump in for just a sec? Absolutely. We're hitting the noon hour, which is the time that the, the webinar part was supposed to stop.
but we're not done. And if this were a real <laughs> online course, you know, sometimes if you're doing it synchronously, you'd really have to stop at noon. But we're going to keep on going. Um, Just for a couple minutes. For a couple minutes. And some of you out in webinar land, you may have to go. But this is all archived. So if you have to go in 30 seconds, go ahead and go, because you're still going to be able to get access to this um, when it's archived, which will be soon. OK. Thanks. And I only had one left on this list, but <laughs> and that was be human. One of the things, and I'll get into this a little bit more, we're talking about social presence. Um, we always do a video at the beginning of every week where we pull out um, some interesting things that happened the week before and use people's names. So Maria talked about this, which we thought was really interesting. Um, David mentioned a question about blah, blah, blah. So not everybody's, but just pull out a couple and change the, the people that you talk about each week. Talk a little bit about what's coming up. And we always like to, I co-teach with another woman, um, play off our personalities a little bit. So we kind of joke and do silly things. And we've had extremely positive feedback from our students about being human and being live people, seeing us on video, hearing our voices. And we do the same with them. One of our first assignments is to have them create a video where they introduce themselves to the class. So you actually get to see them and hear them. And you start creating some of that sense of community amongst the students. So that's really important. Um, that leads me right into my social presence. This slide talks about there's actually three presences. The teaching presence is what we've been talking a lot about this morning with the design, the facilitation, and the direction of the learning experience. How you guide students through giving them feedback, how you assess them. The cognitive, pushing those upper levels of blooms with the critical thinking skills, how you scaffold their learning, how you encourage them to become active learners. But social presence in particular is that building of a safe environment, get, letting them get to know each other so that they're willing to take risks, especially in language learning. You don't want to feel stupid if you say something wrong, right? You need to create that safe environment so they do feel comfortable with doing what you're asking them to do. And there's a couple of other things here about giving them room to breathe, reflection, not just always do this, do this, do this, do this, but giving them a little space to kind of digest things. Asking for feedback. I'm not sure if you do this in your face-to-face -face classes or not, but at least like a midterm, how are things going? Online, you might want to check after the first week or two and say, how are you doing? How's it going? Is there something that's really confusing that maybe I should change how I do or something that could help you learn a little bit better. So be sure and get that feedback from your online students. Um, welcome questions, whether they're group questions or private questions. Um, one piece of advice one of my online teachers gave me was praise in public, criticize in private. Sometimes you want to do some general critiques of things, but maybe not with specific student names, that sort of thing. Um, and be human. Show who you are. Let your personality come through. Number of people who create online courses put up all the information and ask quizzes about it, and the teacher is never there. And I think, especially in languages when we're talking about communication and, and that sort of thing, the teacher really needs to be a presence in the classroom. So consider doing a lot of little mini videos that show you and show your personality. Anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I tried something once trying to get student feedback. And in Blackboard, I'm not sure if Moodle does this or if um, Canvas does. I, I, I really don't know. But in Blackboard, um, there's a way of having a discussion board that's anonymous. So you could ask sure. your students, say, look, I've got a zone that's anonymous. I can't find out who you are, but this is where you can give me feedback um, and it won't be attributed to you. It's a little scary to do that. The students did beautifully. I mean, I didn't get anything horrible, but sometimes somebody just really needed to vent and they didn't want to vent under their own name. So that anonymity was really good for them. 
Now, obviously, had there been threats or something like that, yeah, you could get back to it, but you'd have to go through the university lawyers to do that. But it, you know, if there was something like that, you could get back to it. But I, I say to the students, you know, barring that, I can't find out who wrote this. So go ahead, freely express yourselves. And uh, you could probably even actually turn that into a moderated thing so it wouldn't go out to the students as a whole, but you could read it and just get that back channel. Another way to do that is a Google form. Same thing. No. Oh, okay. If it's not, if you can't do it within your LMS. And speaking of evaluations, well, where are we with this? I think we're getting close to it. So back burner, beyond emoticons, how can you create social presence online? Those of you who will be here in the afternoon, we're going there. Um, and we've already seen quite a few. How can you create a safe environment while encouraging collaboration and the growth of community? Because you really need, and we talked about that in the group that was over here. Um, how do you get this community? So we'll talk a little bit more about that in the afternoon. And I'm sorry to those of you in the in the uh, virtual community, but um, you can go ahead and email me or Marlene or the folks at Coral, and we'll we'll talk to you about these things if you have questions. So the evaluate, just remember, evaluation is at the heart of this. Every time you're doing something, evaluate it. Get somebody to take a look at it. Um, when you're actually in implementation, we're talking about assessing student learning for them, but also for you. It's constantly evaluating and switching things up, doing revisions. Um, this, is, this is a process. This never ends. So it's, it's constantly in movement, and evaluation is at the heart of it. I've so. never taught the same course twice. Oh, yeah. Mine change <laughs> enormously every single time. Yeah, every single time. So um, we promised training today to help you to begin planning online language teaching and learning. Um, so if you would, not the people who are staying who are from UT, but those of you who are online in the webinar, if you would please go to the survey and let us know how we did, because we need evaluation. And uh, Absolutely. so that's it. And just one other question kind of thinking about this. Um, where do you see language education 10 years from now? And I just put some images here of possible ways of seeing it. You know, And the babies are doing the iPads. You know that, right? You know that. So really soon, but really, really soon we're going to have them. And by then, they're going to have been probably not Google Glasses, but implants of some sort. And you see the holograms? We're really close.